What's up, guys? Welcome to Lato Files. I'm Chris Lato. Today's video, I'm going to go through Stephen Greer's disclosure event. Stephen Greer is a very controversial figure in the world of ufology. If you Google him, it says about Stephen McCon Greer is an American ufologist who founded the Center of the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence and the Disclosure Project, which seeks the disclosure of alleged classified UFO information. I had an interview, an over hour long interview with Stephen Greer a few weeks ago about this project. It was very interesting. Changed my views really on Stephen Greer based on Grush's recent revelations that there has been a sophisticated disinformation campaign. Personally, my own personal belief coming as an outsider into this, I was very surprised by the level of hatred, anger, distrust sown against Stephen Greer. To me, it just, I don't know, it didn't seem warranted based on everything that I saw when I actually went and listened to him. So my own personal belief is that that sophisticated disinformation campaign, one of its primary goals and jobs, very success stories, is that making this man, Stephen Greer, Dr. Stephen Greer, look like a quack, okay? But he's been doing these disclosure projects since 2001. He had, in 2001, he had a disclosure conference much like this. And now, 2023, 22 years later, we hear again information. And this time, the information is pretty disconcerting, actually. If you look at what the witnesses are claiming, pretty disconcerting. So I'm gonna go through that. Very interesting witness testimonies, and we'll focus mainly on that. Thanks for being here. Please smash that like button if you do like this content and subscribe to get future notifications. As always, please support the channel on patreon.com forward slash Chris Slato and you get exclusive content. Chris Slato, welcome to Lato Files. I actually honestly believe these civilizations regard the earth as precious, that humanity is filled with promise. And I think they have been trying to warn us and keep us from going down the path of either geophysical uh, disaster or uh, war that, that would be using these sort of weapons. The most dangerous weapons are unacknowledged. They're not the nuclear ones. They're the ones that Mr. Hecker is talking about and others. And i we have a great deal of information on that. I have folks who work for the NSA and also Raytheon who have used some of those uh, in horrific ways to trigger deliberately uh, earthquakes and other problems. So th this is something that is very serious um, and it has to be gotten under control. When I say that these projects... Okay, I learned interviewing them is he doesn't stop actually, he will just continue. So finding breaks is difficult, but that's one of the claims here. He talks about Hecker is a witness, we'll go through it shortly, of claiming that there is these advanced weapons. This is some sort of neutrino scalar weapon that is in the Antarctic ice, is a neutrino scalar weapon, which is above nuclear weapons. And Stephen Greer, again, making claims that people just cannot believe. You know, it was the $2 billion. He was offered $2 billion in cash to stop what he was doing. And that number, $2 billion, just seems so excessive. And to me as well, it just seems unbelievable. So his claims are unbelievable. But let's look at what he says. I mean, it could be, could be correct. Now, they can be known by people who are working in a skiff and have a vault and who have the ability to then pursue it in the interest of national security. That has been provided to these key offices. So I just wanted to give you that as sort of an overview of how the list was constructed. It is by no means complete. So there's actually 122 crash retrieval cases in the archive, meaning the witnesses' testimony, who they were, when they were there, where the locations is, sometimes up to where the gate is. And that's been handed over to the United States government this week. So this is Stephen Greer's a uh, large claim. He says five terabytes of data have been handed over with all of these names, locations, all of the evidence that they have in the disclosure project. And so Stephen Greer says that this is what they have. They have government documents from the US, Canada, Australia, Russia, UK, and more. Okay, that makes sense. 145 top, top secret facilities and bases map, 752 witnesses, 752 witnesses. Amazing. So most of these are anonymous. Files with witness testimony and some video with supporting documents and information. So some video, 
which lead to the compilation of the top secret facilities and bases map. Okay. 121 UFO crash retrieval cases, 121, I oh, mean, again, it's just mind blowing numbers, but if that's it, that the numbers are just too impossible to believe. So we don't believe them. That's really what I'm saying. Some documents include names of witnesses. There are a number of deep throats that provided Intel and whose names were unknown that are not included in the archive. This is the most replayed part of the video here. And what you see is Stephen Greer is just going through and listing all of the data that they have. Yeah, pretty interesting. So that's the main disclosure product that was turned in those five terabytes of data along with the witness testimony. So let's get to the witness, witness testimonies, man. Some of these are just insane. Thanks to this gentleman and all of these people sitting next to you and all of those volunteers. The things I want to share are first, just a little bit of historical information quickly. You know, the name Kelly Johnson, Kelly Johnson and the gentleman Ben Rich who succeeded him. I, I got to know very well. I've got a 1953 UFO report signed by Kelly Johnson and his engineers. And in that same UFO thing, about four hours later, it appears over his house. And I, Dr. Greer has a letter that Kelly Johnson sent to the national director of intelligence saying, this is real. This needs to be investigated. I am a very fortunate to have been a pilot. I've got over 7,000 hours of time. I currently live in Alaska with my wife, Alice, and a whole bunch of grandchildren. And that's a real blessing. The uh, two documented encounters, and I'm sorry that, uh, do they have that up on the screen? Or are they just showing that on? I, I'll make sure it's available, but these are the two airplanes that I flew that uh, had UFO encounters. The first one was during the latter stages of the Vietnam war. I was flying an operation called linebacker three going into Laos. I was in an orbit at 14,500 feet, just south of the Laotian border. And my two armed escorts, because the RF is unarmed and they're there to protect me, were delayed on takeoff. So I'm doing just a racetrack type of orb. There are things that monitor in warfare called GCI sites. These are radar sites that vector in the fighters to the, the people that are intercepting you. What happens next is that I get an alert from three GCI sites and the early foreman AWACS that I've got traffic that is a fast mover near Mach 1 coming out of North Vietnam, Laos, heading for me in orbit. That concerns me because my armed escort isn't there. Now I'm completing about halfway down this next pathway and they tell me, oh, don't worry. That target is above 70,000 feet and you know, it can't get at you at this point. So I'm a little relieved, but then I finally get to see it and it's on a wavelength of light that I've only seen one other place. And that is in a nuclear pile on an active nuclear power generation. And it's called teller light. It is very unique, very white, very, very bright. So we look up and it's an 11 o'clock and over here off my left shoulder, about 10 o'clock. My back seaters is stumbling to make their emergency detection systems and our defensive systems active. We watch this thing and it's way above there and I'm a little relieved until all of a sudden through the mid term, mid uh, term of the, uh, the, uh, orbit, it comes from 70,000 feet down to 12,500 feet in two seconds. And now it's tracking off my nose and staying at five nautical miles away. 
that sets off everything in my aircraft. The three GCIs and the AWACS are really concerned about me at this point. And as we go on parallel with this thing flying at five miles an hour, I'm really concerned. And then they ask me, will you intercept this if you can? Well, the airplane, the RF-4C, is a Mach 2 plus airplane. I've been in flight for a little while, and so I probably, if I go to afterburner, I only have about 15 minutes of fuel left. But I agreed to intercept. The reason I did was I have a new one-of-the-kind IR infrared sensor, but it's on the bottom of the airplane. So my backseater and I agree, hey, this is important. We can see this. We need to document it. I go to afterburner, and we accept, accelerate very quickly through Mach 1, go up to about Mach 1.2, and I close to within three nautical miles of this UFO. And we've got it now on our radar. We've got it pegged. The guy in the back seat can't see it on his display because that sensor's pointing down. So I pitch up, do a supersonic climb up, and he says, we got it, we got it, we got it. That white light at three miles goes out of sight within less than two seconds. Wow, amazing. This is just the first witness. Okay, so Lieutenant Colonel Heckert retired. 7,000 hours, 7,000 hours. I have a little over 1,800, I think 1,834 fighter hours. You know, he has 7,000 hours. I mean, U2 and an F4. So he's flown at all altitudes, all levels. He's seen so many things. And I mean, do we, are we really not going to believe this guy? We're not going to believe him. So this is, this happened many decades ago. Okay. So interesting. He has another case. Go ahead and check it out. Just almost just as interesting in a U2. So check that out as well. I don't know if this is the most disconcerting case, but man, one of them for sure. Michael Herrera, U.S. Marine Corps, Indonesia. Well, let's see this story. This story is just unbelievable. Let's check it out. Well. Thank you all for being here. Um, what I'm about to tell you hasn't been something that I've disclosed until recently in the help of Dr. Greer, among other people. So I appreciate your help with this. In 2009, we were, my unit, which was uh, most integrated infantry battalion in the entire Marine Corps, which was 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, was called in to do humanitarian assistance operations out in the Philippines, Operation Kitsana, which we were attached to the 31st Marine Additionary unit, which conducts maritime operations all throughout Southeast Asia in conjunction with the 7th Naval Fleet, which houses one uh, landing helo Grail HD among LPDs, which is what I was on, called a uh, USS Denver. That's where I'm from, so kind of felt like home. Now, during that operation in Ketsana in the Philippines, they had actually heard that a tsunami and earthquake hit the western part of Sumatra, which is western Indonesia. Padang City more specifically. Out of all the ships in the 7th Fleet, the ship I was on was the only one that was routed to that location, which was oddly strange. But then again, this is my first humanitarian operation, so I don't know the logistics of it, but the skipper of the ship would probably know that information. Okay, so Michael Herrera, he's on humanitarian operations in the Philippines, and he gets called off just his one lone ship, right, gets called off to go on this, this other little task here. Check this out, man. I mean, just this one's pretty, pretty disconcerting. So um, this happened September 3rd. We end up getting called and dropped anchor around October 8th. We are briefed in a ward room, which is the officer's mess where they eat um, like their cafeteria per se. We're briefed that there is some of President Obama's family members that are present on either in the city or somewhere near there. They had a SEAL platoon that was ready to go to retrieve the people. Um, us knowing well that uh, Indonesia is also the second largest terrorist capital where they train these guys, and they'll send them up to whatever theater of operation where anybody wants a piece of the United States, they, they ship them up to go handle it. So we know that well, and um, we were then briefed that we were armed during this operation just to also provide security for the transportation to basically drop off uh, 
medical supplies, sheltering items, food, purified water, things like that. So um, they ended up selecting certain Marines to go ahead and do this. We were only in six of uh, six, six Marines. So it had NCOs on top of uh, other Marines to help with that. So we again boarded uh, C-53 Super Stallions, which are gigantic helicopters that are roughly 100 feet long. I love the design of them. It's my personal favorite. Um, we ended up boarding this on the ship. We flew to the southwestern part of the city, which has looked a lot uh, different through satellite imagery that I've recently seen. Back then, is a lot different, especially because most of it was decimated, on fire, rubble, flooded, you name it, basically the worst kind of scenario you could ever see. From then, um, once we touched down on this landing strip, it took probably about two minutes. Um, and then again, the pilots got confirmation to go ahead and drop us into certain parts. So we again dropped to a hasty LZ, which took probably about six, seven minutes to fly to from the position. And uh, we dropped to a hasty LZ. We got off the bird. And what we were instructed to do at that point through the briefing was to push to a high ground, at least to get better observation. As a Marine, the tactical advantage that you get from having a um, you know, observation from a top is you see everything clearly. You could also, you know, coordinate from there. At that time, we had did a tactical column, which we are able to get eyes on pretty much everything, especially with six Marines. So we have the effective uh, communication at that point. If we need to, we can properly do it with the amount of ammunition we've got, as well as the weapons that we were only m 16 fours. So at that point, we decided to push forward. We trekked up about 300 meters. At this time, I have a Panasonic camera that has the ability to take photographs. It has the you know, ability to take videos, obviously. When we got to this high point, I was taking video camera, and I had actually turned to the north, which just kind of slopes down. And right there was some that felt like a sore thumb, especially with jungle terrain, things like that, junk, you know, vegetation, very green stuff, was something that stuck out so well. It's always going to be in prison in my mind for the rest of my life for 14 years was something that was rotating and was transitioning between colors like a light um, gray as well as a dark black so in between that's what it kept it was very smooth we had we all looked at each other so we got online and we decided to investigate the first thing i want to say is i actually took pictures and video of this before we actually trucked down we had a dumb pouch where we basically if we expend ammunition we want to retain our magazines, so we put those there. Okay, so this story is just amazing, amazing to me. All right, so Michael Herrera, he seems like a Marine. He's talking about a CH-53. That's the biggest helicopter. It's got two rotors. Everyone I've talked to that actually has done operations, like uh, combat rescue operations, that's their favorite helicopter, is the Chinook. Why? Because it goes the fastest. It's the biggest. It carries the most, goes the fastest, and it can just, even without landing, it can go like this, and people can jump off the back. So it's details like that that tell me that at least he knows basic combat uh, tactics. The other point really concerning is the idea that they brief them that they're going to go rescue Obama's family members, right? It's just some total BS, but very important mission that justifies them to go off to this area. Why were they going into this area? Maybe they suspected there would be other fighters there and they needed U.S. Marines to help them fight. <laughs> I don't know. I mean... Seems like we can just go and look. We want to find out where the, the issue is, is who ordered that ship? Who ordered that ship to go to this operation? That'd be the biggest question. Who ordered Obama's family members needed to be, you know, rescued, right? As he dropped off into the jungle and here we go. Now it's this illegal operation. It says drugs here, drugs and weapons loading. But as we find out later, it may be biological components. My guess is that it's, it's biological components possibly even people. So again, this, there's a reason I flipped out, guys. So I dropped my camera on there, um, and we decided to go down. We didn't have any communications, which was weird, and that was a very odd thing, and it's something that either could have been good that we didn't, or it could have been something that could have been very bad. Um, and it's just how, however you want to look at that. Once we got down this slope, we were approximately 150 meters away from this when I got to the, when we all got to the point where we can see it, just like behind here, again, Mr. Shrat, normal job. You can see that the craft here actually had, uh, was roughly about 300 feet 
And the reason why I know this is because you can fit three helicopters that we flew in on underneath this craft. That's just mind blowing to me. I mean, 300 feet, 300 feet, that's a hundred yards across, just rotating, right? And this would be humans, okay, using, clearly using alien technology, right? And what are they moving? This is, I mean, this is wildly disconcerting, okay? And this is one of the reasons I flipped out everyone, because why would you not believe this man? Why would you not believe Michael Herrera? And I know what Mick West is going to say is, it's just some guy saying stuff. But why would he lie? Why is he lying? Okay. Honestly. So you have this 300 feet across. We know the U.S. government is actively hiding a crash retrieval program. We have whistleblowers. We have many people saying they've been on the program. And we have this dude saying, I saw it happening. Okay. And what he's going to go on to say is that these aren't weapons. He initially thought they were because they're in these can canister containers. But what he said is they had like humidity control or environmental control devices on them, which is the, yeah, just very, very disconcerting. It was rotating in a clockwise motion. The panels here that you see, um, the black ones, at least three of them was like a bat to black, very dark. I have no idea what that was. On the very top, there was like a pyramid structure that you could see the shadowing. He listed that was a pyramid structure. And it had an audible hum to it, um, kind of like a guitar amp if you were to unplug that like a transformer it's very audible if i was to hear that sound again i could tell you okay probably this thing or something similar to that it's very distinct and the way it was floating which was about 10, you know 15 20 feet off the ground it was kind of a very eerie thing to see because i've never seen anything like that in my life when we got up to that point we were then intercepted by a team of um, soldiers or um, rogue military force if you will the most concerning thing about this is they all had american dialects had American gear, they had OTVs, black, they had black camouflage, they had very similar setups to what we have, but more high speed, something what you would see special operation, operation groups these days have. They had no insignias on, they had no ranks, they had nothing that would signify who they were. They had black ball caps, they had M4A4s that were equipped with ACOGs, which was a step up from what we were currently issued, as well as PEC-16 IR illumination devices that you use for night vision patrols, things like that. So we were engaged. We had eight of them drop, put the drop on us. They're audibly hitting, blow the safety selectors off. So terrifying here is he says, these are American operators, American special forces, or some sort of American dialect using American weapons, American systems, ACOGs. Okay, where are you going to get those weapons with those fancy ACOGs? Where are you going to get all those fancy IR illuminators? An IR illuminator is a, is a laser pointer you can use at night. And if it's good enough now, you can call in bomb strikes. So special forces, we work with special forces. They have a laser. They can sneak around, get back there, laze the target, right? From, from hidden, from cover. They can laze the target. And now we can drop a bomb on those targets. Or they can get coordinates using those lasers. Probably now they just have the coordinates. And now they say, hey, blow up these, this building at this location. Okay, so that's it. So this is basically, we have eyewitness testimony from Michael Herrera. Again, why would he lie on American special forces, American paramilitary military forces working with alien technology? I mean, right here from 2009, this is 14 years ago. And what are they moving? Why are they doing this? I oh, mean, this is totally unsad, everyone. This is total, total, <laughs> yeah. And you guys just aren't gonna believe it. That's the main thing is you're just not gonna believe it, right? Cause Steven Greer is discredited. He's just a scammer. But is this guy a scammer? Is Michael Herrera uh, a scammer? Yeah, so we're going to move on, but I, yeah, watch the rest of that. They treat him terribly. Okay, they threaten, threaten his life. One guy says, hey, should we just kill him now? So they're, they're actively intimidating him, if not almost thinking about killing him, if that is actually the truth. So again, terrible stuff. Okay, next up was Stephen Digna Jr. So he is basically a range officer. He manages all of the range assets. Okay, so these people take their job very seriously. They work out on the aerial ranges, bombing ranges, up in the Uter, in Utah, Nevada. We have these vast regions of ranges where you're dropping weapons. You want to make sure it's safe all the time. So these guys take their job very seriously. And he was a range officer out there. And he brings up two amazing, just amazing interactions. The first one, he sees a giant boomerang craft. 
He's out on the range and sees this giant flying wing boomerang. So it looks like a B-2 aircraft, right? Except what's so crazy about this is it just hung in the air. It just sat there, totally motionless. And it had the lights that you see here, right? Like lights like we see on Phoenix lights. And this thing just hung there. And what's amazing is the people around him knew it was one of theirs. It's like, oh, that's one of our birds. Okay, but this is basically a floating, flying B-2 triangle craft. So the TR-3B, I guess, something like that. This man is saying that he saw it at that location in Fort Irving, California, 2000, 2001. Amazing stuff. And then he has an even more intricate, more intricate encounter. This happens a little bit later. And that one's it's even crazier, even crazier. Okay. Uh, it appeared to be generating seven lights along its wings and underbelly. I noticed another smaller craft oriented on the right side at the, and at the same height as the first craft, approximately 75 feet to 100 yards to its right. The second craft was jet black, V-shaped, pointed towards the first craft. This craft had equally joined, spaced, rectangular sections forming the hull. The craft had a gimbal rack on that deployed from the bottom of the craft. Uh, approximately five to six holographic uh, lights, uh, uh, holographic emitting uh, lights were uh, pointed directly at the first craft. That was my assumption uh, due to the fact that they were displaying a strange color within my MVG goggles. Anyone that knows the old school, you know, two, circa 2000 MVGs, they don't emit color. They give you green, grays, and blacks. I was seeing colors within my night vision goggles. This was not normal. Okay, I've never heard of that, okay? Color inside the night vision goggles. The night vision goggles is just green and it has the white phosphorus. Okay, so there's, I don't even understand how you get color actually seeping through there. But this reminds me of the bouquet effects, the weird effects that we've seen from Jeremy Corbell's releases out on the West Coast with the Omaha, where basically the video comes out as a triangle, where you see a triangle craft. Or in the gimbal, look at the actual uh, gimbal video and it shows up as a strange, weird, glare shape, right? There is something weird there. What I'm understanding and noted from Lieutenant Colonel Hecker is the light is very, very different. It's very strange. There's something with the light. And you also mentioned on Lieutenant Colonel Hecker's example is that they were tracking it on radar, right? So how are you tracking this light ball on radar, right? They tracked it on GCI. So that's ground control intercept. That's their radar tracked it. And he tracked it with his F4. So multiple radars, and they saw it with their eyes. Okay, so you're basically seeing these optical effects. You're seeing the light, then it's also reflecting radar. So it's acting as a wave and a particle. And what's even concerning is that this is ours. Okay, this is our, that, you know, Raytheon up there, secondary V block craft. Okay, these are our craft that our government has not told us about. That is the, that are the claims that they are making with, with many witnesses. Okay, how many witnesses do we need? If we get a thousand witnesses together, is, is that enough? What is the number of witnesses, man? Not sure. And uh, it was my assumption that perhaps these, this was a hologram being projected from the other craft. I can't confirm that. However, that was uh, my assessment at the time and my suspicion at the time. I wanted to throw a baseball at it, but I didn't have one just to see if it was tangible and solid. One of the two men on the observation deck, uh, observation deck from Ray Raytheon noticed the night vision goggles i had he went from chattering cheerfully uh they were pretty relaxed they'd seen these before it wasn't abnormal to them uh, uh he looked at me with a very very severe uh, look of disapproval and anger uh, that i had uh, at that point we both uh they both went calmly inside probably a little bit angry and it felt like as though i had crossed the line i took another uh, look with my night vision goggles the reason this event was not uh, reported uh, was due to the fact that it was not unidentified. I'm going to repeat this very clearly to the cameras. This craft was not unidentified. This was one of our birds. And, uh, to the observer controller that called that out on the range, I'm not going to put his call sign out. Uh, Roger up, eyes on, hands on confirmation. That's our bird, but she doesn't un need w wind to get lift. She was hovering stationary. Uh, okay, so he repeated it twice there. Basically, this was not reported as an unidentified aerial phenomena event because this is one of our birds, right? Because we own it and we're operating it under the auspices of super secret crimes against humanity, BS, where we're going to keep everything secret from the humans. 
just so we can maintain our military advantage and watch our country fall apart at home. Basic game plan. Morons. This isn't a story. It's my story. This is a real story. And uh, don't forget that. This is real. This can't be made up. And uh, I can give you the exact locations. I can drive Dr. Greer and, I, and all of the command, Congress, everyone there to the bunker. So we passed a dry lake bed on the right-hand side. My driver's side mirror reflected a powerful white light into my eyes. I saw a bright white light pop up of, uh, out of the canyon that I had just come from. I looked over my, my left shoulder and saw a zipping light. It zipped through the, the, the curves uh, in that bend, mimicking my exact, uh, my exact track and exactly the speed that I had had. Suddenly, all I could see was a bright light through all of my windows. And at that exact same time, my car's power steering and, and the engine's electrical system, everything died, completely died. Uh, when, uh, when I exited the vehicle, I rushed towards the front end of the car, believing there was someone pointing a floodlight at us. I had some words to say to that man. I stepped through a thick field of white plasma that encompassed, co encompassed a spheroid craft. As I turned to go inspect my, uh, the craft, my wife opened the door and she ran out towards the front of the car and she was yelling, Steve, no. She was instantaneously locked in place in a bright white field of plasma. As I looked at her, I thought to myself, it's okay, she's in stasis lock. That, that plasma enveloped her body with about six inches. I heard a female voice call me state, felt like it was in my head said she is in stasis lock there's a confirmation thank you Dr. Greer. relieved that she was safe i started approaching the craft for further inspection the craft and the car uh the craft and the car uh were nose to nose at a 90 degree formation if you looked at it from a bird's eye view it'd be in an l shape nose to nose the craft was uh there was a plasma field emitting approximately 12 inches off of the craft inside this white plasma field. The craft seemed about Trump, uh, approximately 23 uh, feet long. I stepped forward with my left hand extended and slightly reaching out to it. The craft uh, responded to my movement. Uh, this startled me slightly, but I took it and stood still, just in case. Uh, by moving back and pivoting the nose away from my hand like a cat or a boxer, and it felt like a cat to me. Okay, sorry, lost my place. The exterior looked like uh, polished black onyx. As I approached the craft, I noticed ambient temperature, not hot or cold. Uh, I kind of leaned down and touched the craft, and as I swiped my hand up the craft's starboard side, uh, also towards the front of the craft, uh, it was as smooth as glass. However, when I drew my hand back towards me, it felt like shark skin or a cat's tongue. That was followed by a reaction. Um, the reaction followed my hand. And as you can see here in the, uh, the, the picture, I, I put my hand on the craft like this. And I kind of pushed my head forward. I can't do it here because of the mic. But I wanted to swipe my hand up and look at it like I was planing a piece of wood. Uh, as I drew my hand back, that's when I felt it, this, this strange texture. It felt like uh, tiger skin or a tiger, uh, a shark skin, or, or uh, like I said, uh, cat's tongue. As I drew my hand back, uh, pixels jumped off the craft. Uh, they were like micro shavings. I would call it, they, they, they resembled graphene or magnetite shavings and uh, nano, nano sized particles. As I did that, and as I swiped up first, uh, I guess to get back to that, as I swiped up, the craft emitted a tiger stripe pattern up the, up the starboard side of the craft. As I drew my hand backwards, the pixels popped up. And as I did, the craft purred, it bellowed through my body. I could feel it resonate in my body cavity. Very intense. I felt like a... Tough, man. So this is basically, this craft thing sounds like it's living, you know, basically alive. It's kind of the impression I get. It's the impression he's giving, giving off or it's so technically, technologically advanced that we think it's alive. I don't know. Crazy stuff. I was in contact with a living creature. Yes, sir. The reaction, uh, okay, I'm already done with this. Thank you. As I, uh, as I drew my hand back, 
a lattice work opened up underneath. There was a very vibrant color, uh, colors coming out of the craft, the underskin. This was a very thin nano layer. And uh, there was a mesh work, honeycomb style. Uh, and it was like a lattice work that was like a frame around this. And beneath that was, uh, well, there were filaments flowing. They looked like a neural network. Uh, there, I, I tried to see any 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 uh, universal bus system or any computer systems as the analyst job that I had. I saw none of this. Uh, as I drew the hand closer to myself, uh, trying to peer through all these bright, wicked, beautiful lights that were pinks, blues, and every light color you could think of in the spectrum, uh, I wasn't able to see anything through it. So as I drew my hand this way, I kind of pressed off the vehicle. The vehicle was stable. I mean, this thing was locked in position. It's not like Star Wars when you jump off of something and it moves. This thing was solidly locked in place, solid. I seen a shape right here under my through my elbow uh, as, I, as I, I faced down, and I could see up into the sky above my car a mirage, which was like a silhouette or a heat foil on the road. And uh, the, the stars shimmered in a straight line, and in a, in a very long distance, there was a curve. So it looked, seemed to be curved. Either way, right when that ripple hit in the sky, uh, the stars then refixed back into place. I realized I was looking at a cloaking device, a very, very, very large craft that seemed to encompass the whole desert area that I was under. So again, I mean, just an amazing story. But here is interesting is this is the, the cat-like living craft, if you will. Underneath, you notice plasma emitting pink, blue, and white lights. So they have these three lights here. And then there's like a coax input, resemble coax cable inputs. And I think this is kind of the neural network area he was talking about. So what is this? So now he notices looking up that there's a mirage. He sees a, a giant craft above him, but cloaked, cloaked. Again, I mean, like he said, can't make this stuff up. You could. Uh, at that moment in time, I then, uh, I glanced and panned my view just to try to get the fathom the dimensions of this craft. And I saw a giant white, bright white light uh, floating in the sky. There was a hangar bay door opened. Uh, couldn't see doors. It was just a bright white light. And it looked like a window floating through the sky, maybe even a portal. People might from a distance think, hey, that's a portal. But I obviously knew it was a craft. So this is a hangar bay door. And there was a female uh, silhouette standing there. Uh, at that moment in time, I seen that I heard that same voice, and it said very clearly, um, "You were not supposed to see that. That you weren't supposed to see it." All of a sudden, I began feeling a thud, thud, thud sound. Uh, this was a resonant frequency being pulsed through my body. Uh, as I felt this, uh, it increased in speed. Thud, 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 thud. It was very rapid. You can see the same type of thing in the movie Interstellar. Very similar when he falls through the black hole. Uh, too similar. Too similar. Uh, <clears throat> as these, this thud resonated in my body, I felt my molecular or my cells, maybe the quantum level of my body, feel like it was being resonated. I felt like maybe I'm going to be microwaved uh, or something of that nature. Either way, I seen some bands coming through. I began lifting up off the ground. My vehicle began lifting with me also as this happened. My body tipped. I could see the underbelly of the craft. You're going to see that design right in front of you. Uh, this, the rectangular shape right in the center there looked like a docking socket for an electrical port. If you're going to take you know, a big, big, big uh, uh, male end, this would be the female recepting and receiving end uh, for an electrical charger. Uh, to skip through that, there were some very, very, uh, there's some highlighted uh, parts here. Um, and as you can read them there, I'm going to let you read that for yourself just for time's uh, sake. Uh, however, uh, as this happened uh, instantaneously, I queued in and I was flat on my back and I was staring up at the ceiling uh, and my vision queued into a very, very bright white light. My vision panned over and there was my wife flat on her back on a table. It was smaller than the table I was laying on, slightly lowered, and she still had the same exact expression on her face like she was screaming no. However, however she was no longer stuck in the running position. She was flat. As I panned a little, a little more in front of me to kind of gauge where I was at, and this all happened in milliseconds, guys. This was whole crap. What's happening? So this is a very short encounter here. As I panned over, I saw my vehicle 
with the right the right uh, passenger tires and uh, lifted up. I saw some people in some white suits, fully fully garmented masks with some breathing apparatuses. Uh, they were working on the vehicle. Slightly next to that was a strange blue rack that looked like it could have been an automotive rack. Could have had another purpose. That was my quick assumption. As I as I oh yes sir uh, thank you sir uh, yes sir. So uh, after that had happened, uh, I saw a female right next to me. She was taking some samples from me. It was a human female. She had red hair. Uh, she had very fair skin. Uh, and uh, after that moment, I also, as I panned over, I could see the window and the desert behind me. I realized we were not in space. I could see the desert floor, the exact two rock formations and one far off in the, in the distance. Uh, so this is pinpointed by, by GPS coordinates. Okay, so some interesting points there that uh, considered, if you imagine all the range fowler reports, right, when the pilots are out there flying on the East Coast, the fighter pilots, they couldn't pick up any actual shape. Remember the object shape was really interesting. They couldn't figure out where was it? Is it in the air? Is it a, is it a square? Is it an object? But if you look here now, what if it's a window to a cloaked craft? Okay, so that, that'll look like a square, right? But from different angles, it's going to look very, very strange, very weird to us, very weird to our pilots, right? If you're looking out there and there's a window or a large hangar open in a cloaked giant craft that you're not expecting to see, then you, it would, to us, it would appear like just a portal sitting out in the middle of nowhere of different varying shapes oriented different directions. And now if it moves, now you're not going to see that portal. It's just going to disappear, right? You can imagine a cloaked craft. Yeah, so that would answer that would answer that kind of conundrum, right? Is why is our pilots seeing all these? They can't identify the objects that they're even seeing. Is maybe because the perspective is so off, right? If you think about that, so that could answer maybe the object descriptions that we're getting all these crazy, strange object uh, descriptions. The other point that was interesting was stasis lock. Okay, if you remember Mario Woods, his partner Michael Johnson just totally froze as soon as they showed up at the UFO and reminds me of his wife here, totally freezing. And it sounds like that reverberation, right? When he feels that intense vibration on his body, it sounds like that is them using stasis lock on him. And now bring him in. The other th very interesting thing here, again, concerning issue is humans, right? So if there's aliens, this is obviously alien tech. Why are there humans using it? Why are the humans using alien tech? That's my biggest question. Are they alien humans or are they earthling humans? Do we need to come up with different names for this? So just super concerning. I don't see why this guy again, why he would make it up. And that answers a lot of the questions that uh, kind of I've been wondering, or at least two of the questions. Okay, next up, I'll just talk to this one. It's DC Long, U.S. Army Fort Bragg. So this guy, again, I, I think you guys should watch it. So DC Long, he was with his dad, a contractor. They get a job to go down into one of these supposed deep underground bunkers, right? These deep underground bunkers. As they're walking through to go and inspect for a job that they're going to do as a contractor, he sees this. As he's walking in, he sees a giant hovering granite. This giant granite, right? He said it was off the ground and he bent down to tie his shoes. And maybe this is why he got in trouble. Is he actually pretended to tie his shoe or tied his shoe to see if anything was underneath it. And he said it was completely hovering. It had this black device on the top, and then it had these devices on the corner, and it was completely hovering. Now, on the way out, so his dad and him get the briefing. On the way out, they walk through the same area. This whole place was empty, completely empty of anything, right? They asked him to sign NDAs. They asked him and his father to sign non-disclosure agreements. You didn't see anything here. His dad said, sorry, I, you know, I don't do that. The next day, everything was taken from them. Everything. All their contracts were removed. His dad basically went out of business, went downhill, essentially ruined his life um, for just this split second, seeing this and then not signing the non-disclosure agreement the next day, right? So all, the pe all those people out there who were forced to sign those non-disclosure agreements, now they have been debunked. So the, the U.S. Congress, okay, the actual U.S. government, not this bullshit on the side, secret, covert, illegal crimes against humanity government actions that we're seeing here. Okay, the actual government of the United States 
is going to come after this. What I thought of here was the pyramids, okay? For me, this is just pyramid tech. If you had this tech, now you could easily make the pyramids, right? If you had this gravity tech, this hovering technology, which can just hover a granite slab or a giant ship, a giant cloaked ship, or that ship we heard about, which is just rotating, okay? Okay, and then this one, Eric, Eric Hecker, Raytheon contract at the South Pole. Honestly, this is probably the scariest brief that I heard, man. Hello, everybody. Ladies, gentlemen, members of the press. I'm very happy that you're giving me this attention and this information attention because it needs to get out to the world. I will start uh, since we have to be brief. I have already given all pertinent information and supporting documentation to the Senate Intelligence Committee and Arrow. They informed me that all of my information will be recorded for public record and shared with Congress. It is that important. In 2010, I was selected to go down to the South Pole Station in Antarctica for an entire year by Raytheon Polar Services as an employee of a third-party contractor for the National Science Foundation. I function in a dual role capacity as a tradesman and a firefighter. My responsibilities required me to be more informed than most of my crew and offered me complete access to the facilities. What I learned from this unique experience needs to be shared with the entire world. The technology at the South Pole Station certainly can do what it is presented as its primary purposes, and unfortunately, much more. The Ice Cube Neutrino Detector is presented as a passive listening device for the purposes of the science as presented. But I'm going to skip right through the chase, folks. Uh, I have provided documentation that proves that the 5,160, what they call DOMs, that are embedded in the ice can actually transmit at 2,047 volts each. That gives us a long list of things to consider. It is effectively a multifaceted directed energy weapons platform that I will uh, list rapidly a few things that it can Okay, so we're talking about these scalar waves, right? That's what... Stephen Greer has been talking about, Dr. Greer is saying that we're developing much more dangerous weapons, not just nuclear weapons. What he's referring to is this, okay? This is a weapon, so a directed energy weapon that, according to Stephen Greer, can create earthquakes and who knows what else it can do. So these things can actually transmit each one of these 5,100, et cetera, DOMs, he said, digital optical modules, okay, can actually transmit into a directed energy, like neutrino laser weapon. I mean, what are we going to blow up a whole planet? Are we going to blow up the moon? Are you going to make an earthquake happen? I mean, what is the point? Why do we have this weapon? Like nuclear weapons were not enough. So now we need to be able to just crack the earth in half or cause earthquakes that uh, can be not denoted to any known party, right? Can you tar now can we target an earthquake in a certain nation that we don't like or in a certain city where you hit along certain earthquakes? I mean, this, it needs to be investigated, guys. It really does. I mean, who is in control of these? It doesn't sound like our constitutional government is in control of this. And I don't know why this guy would be lying. Okay, we can go and check. And he was there. Listen, listen to what he says. Check it out. Can do. Vehicle detection. We're learning that these off-world craft, on-world craft, ours or other nations are also emitting neutrinos. So this makes the South Pole Station effectively an air traffic control station for this new level of equipment that nobody's discussing. Quite interesting there. So he says that the, the UAP craft they give off neutrinos. Neutrinos, okay? This is a, a newer particle, okay? Extremely difficult to detect. As far as I understand, we know very little about neutrinos. But according to this guy who worked as a Raytheon contractor, we can detect neutrinos using this neutrino detector, and that's how they're finding out where the UAP craft are. I don't know, maybe they can shoot them down with this. Maybe this is one of those techniques that David Grush was referring to. In addition to the ability to detect neutrinos and the exotic vehicles, I have provided documentation that shows that this is also a system for faster than light communications. In the past, Gary McKinnon has hacked NASA, found the off-world fleet, the list of captains, and it's apparent that if we have faster than light vehicles moving throughout the system, we're gonna need faster than light communications. This is that facility. 
amazing, right? So what he's what he's proposing here is that whoever this is, okay, if it is even the U.S. constitutional government, which I'm starting to suspect that it isn't, okay, then who we have spacecraft out traveling out who knows where, at least in the solar system, getting resources. Could it be elsewhere? How far can they go? How fast can they go? Are they going to other worlds? What he argues is that this would be a faster than light communication device. Can you imagine that? That nothing could go faster than light. But I guess uh, I'm going to be proved wrong shortly. Unfortunately, I have other bad news. The season that I was there, 2010 to 2011, we converted from uh, construction to operations and maintenance in both the elevated station and the detector array. Unfortunately, when they first fired it up, that was when we had the earthquakes in Christchurch, New Zealand. There were two incidental shots before they were able to target it correctly. This is an earthquake generating device as well. This is the weapons of war that we have to deal with now and what Raytheon's hiding. Okay, great. Did you guys vote for that? Did you vote for all your tax dollars being used to, to create a earthquake causing device? Who's going to be liable for all the damages? You're launching off some weapon. And for people that say, oh, we couldn't possibly be doing this. Do you know how many nuclear weapons we've launched and blown up in the atmosphere? It's a lot. It's a lot. So you really think we wouldn't try and do a test here with some secret device that nobody knows about way down in the South Pole so it can't can't hurt anybody. Oh, sorry. Made a couple of earthquakes. This is what we're dealing with. Like, if this is true, again, again, it's just fear. It's fear based. Why do we need weapons? Because we're, I'm scared. I'm scared. That's why I need a weapon. Okay. Well, now I'm scared that they may hurt me in the future. Now I'm going to go and shoot them with my weapon that I already have. This is the, the military industrial complex right here. This is, it's gone off the rails, it's gone off the rails. We need to bring it back, everybody. There's an ELF system at the South Pole Station that when I was arrived, I was told it was off, dismantled, and completely defunct. In my work, I will rapidly just tell you, I had to figure out the circuitry for certain other repairs, and I found that this system is, in fact, completely energized, up and running, and being utilized with the other systems for nefarious purposes as well. So he's there, actually the electrician, they needed him there, and he has to go and see where the power is coming from. And what he says, the power here is unimaginable, meaning they must have some sort of power device, have some sort of power device there. Because what he saw, the amount of power that was going through that system could not be generated on what he saw on site. The Atmospheric Research Observatory is uh, in what we call the clean air sector. I witnessed myself very powerful green laser shooting out of the top of this facility into the cosmos. This, I believe, is a secondary form of long-range communications and or defense system. I am not saying that we need to be scared of anything that's out there, but please understand the military industrial complex is happy to invest all of your money in alleviating their fears. Question of power comes into play for all of these facilities that are present. I assure you, I knew what was going on. I knew the load demands of the facility and all of these new items exceed the demand for the systems that I was presented. I am doing due diligence and research. I believe there is either a secondary power supply there that is either nuclear that uh, was there prior to the start of the Antarctic Treaty, which prohibits such things, and or that there is some sort of exotic uh, power supply system there that just is not in the verbiage of the treaty, so it negates the responsibility to the parties involved. I think that pretty much covers it for time. If anybody, if anybody wants to find out more, I have a website where all this information is at for brevity. I'll wrap it up, but you can go to deciphering.tv. I've documented all of this stuff and information is available. I mean, that's just kind of the scariest briefing I mean, and Michael, I mean, honestly, guys, all of those are just terrifying. I mean, think about it. All of those are terrifying. It means that we obviously, our military obviously has craft that can cloak themselves. We have hovering technology. We have weapons, at least passive detect, and sounds like neutrino energy-directed weapon systems down in the South Pole. 
These are all things that can be followed up on and investigated, and they should be investigated. And yet again, we find that these are crimes against humans. Okay, who is benefiting from this is the nations, the corporations. Those are the ones that are actually benefiting. The, the people that run these organizations are benefiting, but it's the organizations, the companies, the nations that will do anything, right? Kill any humans, discredit anyone, lie about anything, hide anything, create weapons that can destroy our entire world, right? In secret, in secret. Okay, these aren't being regulated. It's not being looked at by any sort of international commission. This is just a secret, supposed, advanced weapon system that our government has. I mean, we have multiple witnesses and we have a whistleblower, David Grush. I know people say he's not the best whistleblower ever, but really he isn't. Okay, he has given all the evidence and he has been backed up by the inspector general. You know, the top lawyer who's supposed to back up whistleblowers has effectively gone all in and is supporting David Grush. And what are they going to turn out? What do you think they're going to find when they actually start looking? Do you think they're going to find this technology, which has been so, so many times by so many people? Thousands and thousands of people have seen this. I mean, are you really just, are we really just going to kill everyone? Is the government just going to kill all those people? And again, this is about us. This is about humans, okay? And the planet is not good for the planet, the military industrial complex. Okay? It's not good for humans, the military industrial complex. Like how much more evidence do we actually need? The sophisticated disinformation campaign that you see is what is not allowing you to even see this as evidence, okay? If you think that this man is crazy and that these people all made this up and this is all fake, that is what's called a sophisticated disinformation campaign, which has affected your brain because all of us humans, me included, is affected by propaganda and advertising. All right, final section here is the lawyer. Man, the lawyer really hammers home why, personally, I am so pissed about it. Let's go to that. Volunteer legal team for the purpose of moving disclosure forward. Once. Okay, so, and the final speaker here is the lawyer, and they have a team of pro bono lawyers. Okay, lawyers working pro bono for free, essentially, because they are motivated, and this is the list of crimes, and it is really bad. Okay, guys, this is why I've gotten, why I flipped out, why I called them all cowards and lying sacks of shit, and I'm saying that their names will go down in history for committing crimes against humanity, and this is the reason, guys. This is the reason. This is what's been done. I mean, look, look at what's been done when you have to keep everything secret. Secrecy denotes secrecy. We will seek justice for those who have been harmed by non-disclosure and technology seizure through filing civil RICO actions, Bivens claims, and numerous and multiple legal theories aimed at getting to the ultimate truth on this issue. The competent under oath testimony already developed by the disclosure product team, Dr. Greer, and these courageous witnesses and represented in the Disclosure Project Intelligence, Ar Intelligence Archives developed over 30 years of Dr. Greer's work may also be used in criminal prosecutions by United States attorneys or criminal prosecutors across the globe to seek indictments on the numerous RICO crimes which have been committed on this issue with the aim of keeping the issue buried. Just a small sample, I know we're short for time, of the crimes that are directly related to this issue. Disclosure Project witnesses have, and gathered intelligence has established the following major crimes. Treason against the United States of America. Murder. Mass murder. Torture. Kidnapping and abduction. Embezzlement of government funds embezzlement of private funds, bank fraud, money laundering, illegal surveillance, insubordination and insurrection against the United States, false imprisonment, witness and whistleblower intimidation, theft of intellectual property, trespassing, burglary, framing of innocent people, government corruption, blackmail, bribery, and illegal use of the government and military property, and many, many more crimes. So that's where we're at, right? I, 
I think reading it out is makes it more powerful. I mean, look at that list, guys. I mean, look at that list. Treason against the United States. That's the first one. Mass murder. Oh, so bad, man. It is so bad. And the point is, this is just decentralization. This is it. So now we have information. We have the information. It can't be kept down. The secrecy, this BS crimes against humanity, where they just, the governments essentially of the world in collusion, okay, because Russia and China also know this. They're in some sort of Cold War. This is exactly what happened back when the, the powers back in the 1500s learned about the world being round, okay? They kept it super secret. Actually, the normal humans didn't learn about it for hundreds of years later. It was took many generations until finally <laughs> they could understand and believe that the world is actually round, okay? But the, the governments, they kept it secret for hundreds of years. There's no way they're going to share those maps, and there's no way Portugal is going to share its map with Spain, how to get to the new world. There's no way the UK is going to share any of these things. So they kept it super secret. The same thing has happened now, okay? This idea that the governments have miraculously gotten better through the, through the years, okay? And now we have freedom and democracy is just BS, everyone, okay? This is not freedom. If people take all of your information, listening to all of your communications, that is not freedom, okay? If people around the world are keeping secret the truth of alien life. Oh my God, you guys are bastards. You are bastards. And those guys out there, you special forces guys with that alien technology, you are a bastard. You're a bastard. How many people have you shot in the dark? How many people have you shot in front of their kids? You don't think it's, you're going to pay for that? You don't think anything's going to happen just because you get away with it in this world? You really think nothing's going to happen? That there's actually no karma? There's no negative to your soul? You guys are clowns, man. It's going to be shown. Look at the data. Check out Stephen Greer. I know you guys don't like him. You think he's a con man? Fine. Then listen to the witnesses. Listen to the, the lawyers that he's bringing on, on the RICO. This is the racketeering and corruption. <laughs> this is an actual case that he's bringing with all of that data, all of those witnesses. You're talking about a mass case against whoever perpetrated this. These bastards who I'm, I can't imagine they're part of the unconstitutional government. But like I said, look in the past. Governments have always done this. They've always kept it secret. It's a fear-based mindset, okay? So hopefully that can change. I've seen finally some stuff in the news. RFK Jeter actually made a speech for the first time in my, you know, since I can remember the last decade, I felt proud to, you know, be American heritage. Maybe something can actually change because I don't know if you guys have left the U.S. I'd implore people to travel, okay? Because the view of America from outside of America is not that positive. It's definitely not as positive as, I, as people imagine traveling around in America. And also one of the most dangerous places, unfortunately, the dangerous place I've been is, is in America. Okay, I've traveled all around the world. I know almost four languages. I've lived in other cultures, several other cultures. And I can tell you that around the world, people are the same, okay? All we want is to be happy, healthy with our families, play with our grandkids and have a meaningful life. Okay? It's not about world domination, us versus them, I'm gonna kill, okay? Russian people do have, they do have concerns. They are normal people, okay? If you went there and actually talked to them, you would find that they're normal people. What are they doing? They're normal people that believe everything that their news tells them. The mainstream news from the government pumps into their brain, okay? Evil, 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 enemy, enemy, enemy. Same thing. You go into America, it's the same thing. Nice people, welcoming people, hospitable people. What do they believe? Everything that their government tells them to do. Russia, bad. Russia, evil. Is that really what we're looking at? China, bad. China, evil. And when I was leaving the Air Force, I went to a major, the largest group meeting in Las Vegas. This is where the Air Force every year for web tech, called web tech, every year they bring in the top fighters from all around the world, right? All of the leaders, the, fight, the combatant leaders in the U.S. Air Force come to this event, right? Thousands of people up on stage. What, what did I see when I was there? A general, four-star general, super charismatic, can talk amazing. You would follow him. He's a leader. Stands up on the stage in front of all, I don't know, three or 4,000 of us. And all he had behind him was a giant flag of China, just a giant flag of China. And the whole speech, multiple hours, was just, here's your enemy. This is the enemy. We need to be ready for drone, long-range drone warf warfare in a contested environment. Over the horizon drones. We'll, we're going to have layers with our aircraft in the back. You people are fucking morons. 
You're idiots. You're going to start a war with China. This is your plan. And you're starting it now. You're already starting it. We're preparing. The war is coming. We're going to prepare for a war. Look, China is passing you. China is going to pass you in GDP. You just look at it. They have way more people, right? They just have to get to 20% GDP for each person in China, and they will match the U.S. economy, 20%. Do you think the Chinese can work up to one-fifth as hard as an American? I bet they can work at least as hard as an American. So what's that mean? The, the Chinese economy is going to pass America, undoubtedly, in the next 10 to 15 years. Chinese economy is going to dwarf the American economy. What will America do? If you know anything about political hegemon theory, the most dangerous time is when the current hegemon, the current empire of the world is being passed by an upstart. Okay? The leader at the time right now is America as the empire. As they see China getting stronger, there's a very, very dangerous time, which is right now. It's extremely dangerous when China is not quite definitely stronger than the U.S., okay? They're not quite to that point. They're, they're getting there. They're obviously on a ramp up, right? But when they are about to pass the U.S. or the current hegemon, it's a very dangerous time because the hegemon will often strike out to try and decapitate or hand, handle the upstart. It's like you're running in the race, right? You're in the lead, but you're tired. And all of a sudden, here comes the next guy. He's going to pass you. So there's a time there when they're not expecting it. You can just put out your foot and kick and attack the other country before they can pass. That's, that's the hegemon. And this is extremely, extremely dangerous. And this is the time period we are in. Am I worried about Russia? No, I don't give a shit about Russia. Am I really worried about China? No, not really. I'm worried about America, man. I'm worried about America. Why? For I just explained. Because they are picking a war with China on purpose. Because as China is passing, before they can get to this point, they want to knock China off the later podium, right? They don't want it to be a competitive advantage. This is what we're aiming for. We're aiming inevitability. We're aiming at an inevitable war with China. This is what our military is, is aiming for, is practicing for the leaders in our country. That same four-star general giving that charismatic speech up there, you don't think he's talking to the president? You don't think he's talking to the Joint Chiefs of Staff? Of course he is. Of course he is. This is the wrong way, everybody. We need to take this back. Okay, final point here is... I put this on Twitter, but I think we need to communicate this, everyone. I mean, we're literally careening for a World War III with China that can be obviously fully avoided. We don't need to fight anymore. We have enough resources. We have enough technology to provide abundance to every human on this planet. We don't need a $400 billion going to secret underwater nuclear submarines in Australia, okay? There's 20 million people around in Australia, $400 billion. We could provide with that same money, free energy to every Australian. People are idiots, total morons. Like this should never be allowed to happen. You can write this letter to, I would recommend your two congressmen, your two senators and the president of the United States. I, honestly, people, this is what we need. So this is what I wrote as a draft. So dear whoever, as, as a concerned constituent, I am reaching out to express my deep alarm over two critical issues that currently face our nation, the need for full transparency regarding the investigations into UAPs and the reassessment of our nation's adherence to the principles of the military industrial complex. The acknowledged existence of UAPs has raised significant questions about our understanding of the universe and our place in it. However, the public remains largely uninformed about these investigations due to a disturbing lack of transparency. And that transparency is not getting better. Okay, it's not getting better. FOIA requests are now completely being denied. And by the way, they haven't released another single video. David Grush said they have many, many other videos, just like Gimbal, Fleer, and GoFast, but better and much more compelling. And they have released nothing. Yet again, you've released nothing. Why? Cowards. You guys are cowards. What are you afraid of? You're afraid of giving away national... You guys are the national security concerns. We're afraid of giving away our national security... You guys are the national security concerns. Our concerns as humans is you guys causing a military nuclear war with someone else for no reason because you are idiots, literally idiots. This is the only reason. It is. Sorry. Simultaneously, I, incur I urge you to seriously reconsider the current state of our military industrial complex. Yes. This issue, once famously warned against by President Eisenhower and echo echoed by President Kennedy, who, by the way, was then killed, and then the next week they continued on, has only grown in magnitude and severity. 
the preeminent focus on military strength, the preparation for wars, and the escalating tensions of nations like Russia and China are symptoms of a system that prioritizes conflict over peace and fear over understanding. And that's what it's about, guys. It's about fear. People are scared. America is scared. What happens if America dies? You know what? Nothing, okay? If, you, if you've left America, I encourage you to go and travel. If America gets in serious trouble right now, after all of the bullshit that America has done around the world, CIA, regime change, weapons, I mean, invaded Iraq, invaded Afghanistan. How many millions of people, millions, many millions of people have we killed? And then you talk about with NATO. I supported NATO, but NATO was formed against the USSR. NATO was formed to counter the expansion of the Soviet Republic, the USSR. When the USSR fell in 1990, why didn't we remove NATO? Why is NATO still fighting in Afghanistan? Does that have something to do with preventing the, the spread of the USSR? No. And now it's just going all the way. The only acceptable outcome for the US right now is the death of Russia. For what? Who cares about Russia? Honestly, they have the GDP of Texas, the GDP of Texas, and their primary income comes from fuel, fossil fuels. All you have to do is not give ridiculous subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, which is somehow obviously interrelated in this. I, I feel it as well as the pharmaceutical industry. It's just no reason all of those things can be totally fucked against humans. Has to be, has to be related. So yeah, I think it's all related. People, we need to take this back. This is the time, like really. This is the time. Remember we said the greatest generation? The greatest generation went to World War II, killing a bunch of people. Okay, what happened after that? The worst generation, okay? The worst. We have been put into a military industrial complex. Our freedoms are much, much, much less than in the past. Think about it. Everything you do is watched. Everything you do is watched. And now somebody doesn't like what you do, all of a sudden you can be put away or discredited or killed. We need transparency, everybody. This is totally, totally fucked. The whole system is totally jacked. So anyway, here we go. Biggest part is knowing, okay? If you, if you want to change from being a fat, lying coward, first thing is to identify that you are a fat, lying coward, okay? And then to take steps to change it. Have I always been? No, I I've make mistakes all the time. I've made mistakes in the past, but I want to change. How do you change is by knowing yourself actually looking at yourself. I, I mean, I'm on YouTube and I do get upset when I hear people giving me counter arguments and sometimes I overreact like I did last time, overreacted. But in the end, we need to be able to take those internal points. You have to be able to be debriefed, okay? Uh, when I'm watching people on Fox News, some lady in her 50s, terrible makeup, explaining that we need to continue the war on drugs by bombing cartel members in Mexico because our kids are taking too much fentanyl, right? This is the idea. We want to continue bombing. We want to bomb more people in Mexico because our kids are taking too many drugs. Do you see how this is just totally the wrong way to look at it? It's not a victim mentality, okay? Unfortunately, it has been America that is going around and <laughs> killing people all around the world. Do you even know? Do you even know how many operations we're in right now? How many combat operations do you think America is in right now? Oh, just, a, just one or two? Is that what you think? Really? Really? What about Africa? What about Syria? What about South America? You don't think Indonesia, Philippines have anything going on? What about Afghanistan? Do we have still people in Afghanistan? I bet we have some advisors in Iraq. What about China? Do we have anyone probably in China? What about Ukraine? How many fighters do we have in Ukraine? Hmm, what about Russia? Do you think we have back, you know, special forces people kind of messing around in Russia? I mean... It's out of control, everybody, okay? What, and it, it's not making you safer back home. Your, your country's falling apart. Your schools are getting shot up. So, yeah, it's pretty obvious. So, anyway, knowing's half the battle, guys, and at least we do know. But to be honest, uh, I never thought the world would even get to this point where I'd be able to make a video like this, even positing my claims. So at least there is some sort of progress, okay? And nuclear war hasn't happened yet. We can still stop it, okay? We found out before. And I say we track these people down, we put these people in jail that deserve it, and then we move on with our lives, and we bring abundance and peace to the world. We bring it back to humanity. We have the tech, we have the ability, we have the motivation. What we need is 
the idiots to get out of the way. Stop being fat. Stop being cowards. Stop being liars. Not that hard. All right, guys. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much for watching. Smash that like button. Subscribe for future notifications. And then support the channel at patreon.com forward slash Chris Lato. Thanks so much for watching all the way to the end. Couldn't do it without you guys. Take care. Peace.